We'll start today with a uh, presentation by Simon Yule. Please go on stage. He's an artist um, who's also very much active in the field of free uh, labs, hack labs, and um, free software movement. So please give him a hand. Simon Yule from Glasgow. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I was uh, originally come and asked the speaker because of a, a previous paper I wrote uh, called All Problems of Notation Will Be Solved by the Masses, which was a kind of critical comparison between um, certain forms of free software practice and forms of collective um, music practice from the 60s. Am I completely dying on the microphone? Uh, which sketched out some comparisons of the forms of kind of self-legitimating mechanisms people used in the development of these practices, so such as GPL licensing and stuff. Um, at the time I got asked to do this, I've, I've just recently started to look more into an area that was known as the film and video workshop movement in Britain, which was active in the kind of early 1980s and a certain comparisons with the use of self-legitimating mechanisms and the practices there. Uh, so this paper is partly just gathering, rather than a kind of in-depth analysis of citizen journalism, it's more gathering together some ideas about looking at this kind of comparative model between how practices such as citizen journalism are legitimated and how that compares to kind of previous works, um, which are broadly known as oppositional media. The term opposition media um, in Britain anyway comes out of the kind of analysis of the activist and political filmmaking movement in Britain that Margaret Dixon did in her book Rogue Rebels, which was published back in the late 90s. Uh, the film and video workshop movement of the early 80s rose from a variety of um, strands of development, some of which are quite familiar, but some are kind of less well-known. One um, key and well-known phenomenon was the greater access to technology through widespread availability of video equipment, both at home in terms of VCRs and kind of access to tools and production facilities, etc. This is the very well-known story of independent media. Alongside this, however, there was appearance of a new television channel in the UK, Channel 4, which in its early days made a commitment to presenting alternative and independent voices on mainstream media. And this included a substantial amount of experimental artists' film work. But thirdly, and perhaps less well known, was the influence and involvement of a new working framework for creating film and TV in Britain, which was put together by the unions at that time who were known as Association of Cinematograph and Television Technicians, ACT now known as BECTU. Um, and this was a conscious attempt to put together a kind of um, constitutional framework that would support a new form of working that broke down barriers between industry and public in a way that also created a, a meaningful balance between the two. And this was outlined in a document called the Grant Aided Workshop Production Declaration, published in 1982. The union movement in the UK had long recognized the importance of supporting the development of a media that related to issues and perspectives of the working classes and as an alternative voice to mainstream news. Historically, this had been implemented through the creation of union-run production crews, and formerly much of this work simply replicated the standards of existing state and broadcast media. The independent filmmaking scene that had been developing in Britain since the late 60s in particular um, had a, often a problematic relation to the unions, in that its more informal working practice were often seen as potentially undermining the more regulated practices that unions had developed in support of the workers. And to some extent, the kind of ways of working that artists and experimental filmmakers developed were seen as a trend towards casualization of the, of the filmmaking workforce. The workshop declaration came about as a way of supporting the more informal practices of independent and not-for-profit filmmaking, whilst preventing a drift towards the exploitative ca casualization. It sought what Yokai Benkler would call um, 
to protect non-market production from market exploitation and to pool financial resources in order to redistribute finance across organizations. Formally, what it enabled is that a large number of small groups which have been operating independently in the UK were suddenly given an umbrella under which they could pool resources and franchise resources. Um, And certain agreements, such as the commercialization of any films that were developed through the projects, would feed the finances back into the production of future films. So it was based not just upon an enabling model, but also a redistributive model. Part of the declaration enabled the creation of an integrated framework, um, also enabled um, access to mainstream broadcast through the integration of Channel 4 into this framework. And that was kind of the key unique features of it. Uh, the Declaration endorsed the mode of production that developed out of the film workshop movement of the late 60s through groups such as the Berwick Street Collective and the London Women's Film Group, amongst others. And alongside support for independent filmmaking uh, working methods, which include a more collective sharing skills within a group than would not formally be found within the industry, it also promoted what Paul Long calls a more integrative practice. Uh, based around workshops which addressed issues of distribution, educational work, and provision of film and video equipment to broader public access. Groups within the agreement included um, Juliet Isaacs Group Sankofa, the Sheffield Film Cooperative, and the Birmingham Film and Video Workshop, and later also the Black Audio Film Collective in London. The Birmingham Film and Video Workshop had been created by staff, partly by staff from Stuart Hall's Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies Department at the University of Birmingham, um, figures such as Roger Shannon. And the workshop was therefore able to combine the making of grassroots media with the development of a more critical framework and conscious distribution strategy that accessed both local outlets and community halls and public meetings and via Channel 4 nationwide broadcast. And it was through the Birmingham Film Workshop that John Ocomfra from Black Audio Film Collective came to Birmingham, where in 1985 he found himself caught up in the Handsworth riots. And began filming what he was seeing. This is a photo by Pogas Caesar of John Ocomfra filming the riots as they were happening. And this became the film Handsworth Songs. Handsworth's songs was in some way a development upon the kind of poetic, artistic tradition within documentary making. But it was also a very early example of the idea of in the moment filmmaking that we've come to associate with many forms of citizen journalism. So if you think of the recent kind of um, use of mobile phone footage from protests in Iran, then Comfort was drawing straight from the activity as it happened and that became the basis of the work. Other projects within the Birmingham Film and Workshop itself included groups such as the Dead Honest Soul Searchers, uh, which is an acronym DHSS, who were a filmmaking group consisting of uh, young unemployed who were facilitated by Johnny Turpey. They were a DMI documentary group who made films on issues such as uh, work employment training, but also on home taping. And their film, Why Are They Telling Us It's Illegal, was an early study of the debates around home copying of music. And for those of you interested in file sharing debates, exactly the same kind of paradigms of argumentation are put forward in this film from the early 80s that we've seen again and again regurgitated in kind of recent discussions around file sharing and music. One of the most significant on an immediate political level projects which the film collective were involved in were the Miner's Tapes. These were a series of films produced by and with the striking miners in the UK. This was in the mid-1980s when uh, the miners' strike was in full swing. These came into being as it was felt that mainstream media was largely presenting a biased um, account of the strikes that did not take into cue the, uh, the, the miners' viewpoints. And so a, a whole selection of uh, works were produced which looked at different aspects of the strikes and sought to self-historicize the strikes as they were happening. It's perhaps significant that mainstream news picked up on these and gave coverage to the miners' tapes um, as a phenomenon, but in a way that was very consciously critical. 
Uh, ITV News Channel did a program on the miners' tapes in which they criticized the, the programs as making um, a kind of imitation of serious journalism, which should be treated with suspicion, denigrating as a form of amateur imitation in a rhetoric which is very similar to that which has been applied to recent insurgent media from Iraq uh, developed by groups such as Radio Free Europe. So this denigration of alternative uh, media is amateurish. Can to some extent dog the development of the medium in its early days. Channel 4 eventually pooled support from these projects in 1991, and since then the channel has barely mentioned or credited the work that had been created through the workshop movement, even though it includes many award-winning films such as the Handworth songs and the Minus Tapes themselves. And despite the massive influence that projects such as the Dead on a Soul Search has had on the development of DIY TV production in Britain, uh, with a kind of um, ad hoc, rough and ready style that came to be Channel 4's hallmark in more commercial projects such as the Tube and later the growth of reality television. The Grant Aidy Workshop Production Declaration can in some ways be seen as having an analogous significance development for the development of oppositional media in the UK that the GPL license has had for free software. As a kind of legalistic device, it acts as a self-constituting mechanism that has enabled development of a mode of production that would not normally be supported under market conditions. As a realization of filmmaking practice that enabled a critically informed, publicly accessible medium, the workshop movement was highly successful. But they were always limited by access to the means of distribution, which the various explorations were always constrained. And following Channel 4's withdrawal, much work had until recently disappeared, buried in Channel 4's archives and caught up in complicated copyright agreements. And it's for that reason I'm not able to show you much of this work at the moment. Uh, though the project currently underway is digitizing this work to make it available. In the 90s, uh, and more importantly in the 21st century, we see the emergence of what has come to be known as citizen journalism, out of the confluence of the self-publishing capabilities of the internet and open source production models. According to Dan Gilmore, who's produced one of the first kind of studies of the medium in the book, We the Media, Grassroots Journalism by the People for the People, citizen journalism evolves very much upon the principles of a free market libertarian model. And he cites the Clue Train Manifesto as an important formative document in defining this model. Originally written in 1999 by Chris Locke, Doc Searles, David Weinberg, and Rick Levine, the Clue Train Manifesto, interestingly enough, is not about journalism or about the media as such, but rather about the potential for the internet to support grassroots, uh, but rather about the potential for the internet uh, to have an impact on business models, and in particular in regard to marketing. The Clue Train Manifesto seeks to challenge the centralized marketing practices of PR firms with what it calls a more conversational model. And the manifesto stacks out, stacks out a set of 95 theses, modeling itself on Luther's original Protestant declarations, number one of which states, markets are conversations. The Clue Train Manifesto is, in Dan Gilmore's account, of parallel significance to the emergence of citizen journalism, as Eric Wayman's Cathedral in the Bazaar essay was to defining the development of open source. But unlike um, the, the GPL licensing developed within free software and later inherited by open source, citizen journalism does not share a common reference point of legitimation. It is therefore arguably more fluid, but definitely more laissez-faire in its formulation, conforming to the market-orientated model that Gilmer promotes. And that sense tends towards the proliferation of licensing models under the Creative Commons. Uh, that as critics such as Dimitri Kleiner have pointed out, undermine many of the original aims of the GPL and the free software movement. Nevertheless, there are parallels with the oppositional media movement of the 1980s in determining, allowing greater public access and availability of tools, and in certain extents improves upon it 
partly for the ability to create new tools and not simply to spend, to depend on those provided, and also in its success in distribution and enabling a distribution platform that is separate from mainstream media. In enabling a proliferation of voices, however, operating without an overriding framework, citizen journalism might appear to be emblematic of Antonio Negri's model of consistent power, one which arises from the force of public energy rather than guided by any limiting directives. Interestingly, Gilmer's account places the rise of citizen's journalism in a moment that seems to echo the conflict between people and empire that an independent United States rose from, one that was heavily driven by independent media, a media which Negri states embodied the practice of the revolution prior to the founding of the US Constitution. The application of this model to the internet, however, is perhaps problematic. Negri posits constituent power as a force of power that exists outside of constitutional power. But as commentators upon information media have stated, such as uh, Geertz and Scott Lash and others, there is no outside to information. And therefore the construction of an outside power is perhaps a self-delusional model. With regard to the mode of production, information-based or informationally systematized production relates to Boltanski and Chapielli's model of the connectionist policy, in which anything that enables the construction of links within a network can be used as a means of acquiring strength and connectivity across the network, regardless of its content or intentional address. And this critique, in some senses, can be applied to the media uh, coverage of the use of so-called citizens' journalism methods in the protests in, election protests in Iran. What became significant in the coverage of the Iranian protests was the ways in which it became aggregated in different forms to suit different agendas. In a sense, it was a harvesting of constituent power to enable a kind of marketing campaign for various agendas that were not necessarily adherent to the actual situation. And in some sense, it was a marketing campaign for Twitter. And it's significant uh, that the US government stepped in to maintain Twitter's servers during the very kind of crux of the election protests. As Alistair McIntyre's critique of liberalism suggests, however, this lack of outside is not a new situation that has arisen from information technologies, but is rather endemic to liberalism itself. McIntyre writes, what is permitted in the arena of liberal free speech is the expression of preferences, either the preferences of individuals or the preferences of groups. It may well be that in some cases it is some non-liberal theory or conception of the human good which leads individuals to express the preferences that they do. But only in the guide of such expressions of preferences are such theories and conceptions allowed to receive expression. The arenas of public choice came to be understood not as places of debate, either in terms of one dominant conception of human good or between rival and conflicting conceptions of that good, but as places where bargaining between individuals, each with their own preferences, is conducted. The culture of liberalism transforms expressions of opinion into what its political and moral theory had already said they were. So debate at the first level has no outcome, but the participants in debate find that as a second level, their points of view are included in the tallying and weighing of expressions of preference which the institutionalizations of liberalism always involve, counting votes, responding con to consumer choice, surveying public opinion. And we can see that Gilmore's model of citizen journalism fits exactly within this paradigm. Similarly, the, this kind of audit culture basis of debate within the, the liberal free speech arena can be seen also related to the technological handling of online communications under the paradigm of collective intelligence, which is a set of algorithms that collate and aggregate information according to various metrics, such as recommendations and tag aggregators, developing various ways of harvesting user, user data from online activity. As many of these tools work on identifying patterns of similarity and association, they tend towards constructs which are often presented as forms of consensus, 
what are better described as equivocalities that lack the processes of deliberation argument that shape genuine consensus. RSS feeds become the news anchorman of the 21st century. But as a viewer, one is no more able to argue with a feed than with a TV presenter. And indeed, one is only able to opt for a different set of preferences. This raises questions of the democratic potential of online media. Does it enable a deliberative multivocal democracy, or is it marketplace trading in aggregates? The success stories of citizens' journalism, which are presented by writers such as Benkler and Gilmore, are often correctional stories rather than critical ones. Stories in which people seek to put right or perceived wrong, but do not develop a practice of criticality, such as the um, exposure of voting machines, um, errors in voting machine computational machines in um, statewide US elections. Moreover, important, do they help develop such a practice of criticality within their audiences. From the perspective of seeking the development of critically in, criticality in critically informed modes of practice, the GPL and related open licensing frameworks are insufficient, precisely because they are restricted to issues of distribution and circulation. Modes of production are instead being constituted almost through the back door via the, the formulations of web service APIs such as those of Technocrati and Google. Power relations within 21st century media are seemingly expressed in the controlling of the potentialities of aggregation, therefore. In this sense, the web service API becomes, in Negri's words, the constitutional machine, which in order to continue to function according to the rules, must present itself as a sociological machine of selection of a representation adequate to the constitution. The freedom introduced in the political sphere is destroyed in the administrative sphere. The stronger constitutional nature of the video workshop movement, therefore, which addressed not only issues of distribution, but also modes and methods of production and redistribution of resources within that, arguably made it a stronger force than the idealized constituent force that Negri promotes and as often feeds the rhetoric of citizens' journalism. Contrary to Negri, the effectivity of constituent power perhaps therefore does reside in moments of constitutionalization, and is to be found in their rostist call for development of new institutions. As such, critical practices seem to work best when they evolve around intensified local networks that operate across different media and have a strong sense of situatedness. These create a kind of offline shadow network in which the internet does not exist as a main site of struggle or organization, but rather as a repository that enables a later form of self-reflection and self-history, which in turn may be the basis for the formation of a new constitutional framework within the group. A recent example of this from Glasgow has been the use of the internet in a series of protests around school closures, where local communities across the city made quite extensive use of social media network, social network media, blogging tools, and video. The interest in the campaign itself was not focused or organized through the network. But its presence um, in the wake of what has, to be honest, um, a campaign that prevented the closure has nevertheless enabled a reconstitution of the groups around new themes that the process of self-mediatizing has enabled them to reflect upon.
In a sense, this potential for self-reflection relates back to a conference Hansworth songs, which, unlike um, the mobile phone media portrayals we see of events such as in Iran, do not simply limit itself to the in-the-moment experience, but also open that out to a longer deliberative self-reflection. In the case of the Glasgow campaigns, this self-reflection is not built into the frame, but rather exists outside of the frame. And the powers of the protest are reconstituted in a new form. How constitutionalism operates, therefore, needs to be more carefully negotiated. Perhaps we need a kind of critical constitutionalism that does not seek singular inscription in bureaucratic modes of production or technocratic license regimes, but rather a disaggregation of those frameworks which seek to harvest it. Okay, we'll finish there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Simon. Are there questions? Otherwise, I'll start with one. Um, about the last, your last phrase, actually, the critical constitutions that you are calling for, could you tell us a bit about that? What did you have in mind? Um, there's, there's an interesting example coming up. I'm going to do a sales pitch here. There's an interesting example coming up in Constance Junctions Festival, which is GUDIF, which I think provides a kind of practice of critical constitutionalism, and that it's a study of the user licensing systems of many of the online social networking systems, and looks at how those licensing systems, which I'm arguing are a form of constitution, are reformulated over time in ways that actually elide and omit the constituents from that process. So, so to a, pro a project like GUDIF, um, in foregrounding this process, creates a kind of critical constitutionalism. Example. Something to look forward to then. Sorry? <laughs> Something to look forward to. Yeah. Any other questions? Not for now? Ah, Geert. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, uh, I was blogging your, uh, your uh, thing, so I, I paid really noticed what you said. You uh, came back to the example of uh, twittering in, um, in Iran. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I suppose you referred to the um, protests in, uh, in June. Mm -hmm. um, could you elaborate a little bit on that? What, how, did you follow it yourself? The, what, was your, uh, what was your impression? Because there, I think it, it's really an uh, interesting um, uh, example in that it, it really shows the borders of what we can and cannot do uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, with these uh, tools. What I think shows well, in the, the British media, um, the protests were presented as the Twitter revolution. And we were presented with this story that the use of Twitter is what primarily enabled the organization of people on the streets. However, um, more detailed studies of the use of Twitter around those events have shown that the vast majority of Twitter activity happened outside of Iran. And it was actually commentary upon Iran by people not involved, rather than direct expression of those who were involved. So, in a sense, what you actually saw was this kind of harvesting of activity to then be used and reconstituted in other forms. Um, so, it, it was not so much the, the revolution was not Twitterized, um, and it wasn't a revolution anyway. Um, so, it was a, a key example of how, in terms of the limitations of this media, is that it enables this kind of constituent force to be harnessed for other uses outside of itself. Um, in a sense, that partly happens through a loss of ability to con control aggregation or have an influence over aggregation. I, I don't want to flog the Twitter revolution thing too desperately, but um, I'm wondering if you ha were aware of or had any thoughts on the recent arrest of uh, two Americans who, during the G20 summit in Pittsburgh, were using uh, radio scanners and then used a Twitter feed to um, relay information about police movements to people on the ground and uh, how that might fit into this sort of uh, longer continuity here. That's, that's one question. And the, the second one is, do you see any relationship between the workshop movement of the 80s and things like the London Filmmakers Co-op and the various uh, local sort of non-mainstream media organizations that were supported, I think, by the Arts Council in Great Britain. Um, 
Okay, I didn't quite catch what was the point you were wanting of the second point. Um, okay, well, in regard to your first point, I haven't followed that incident, so I, I can't really comment on it. I'm, I'm not, um, in, a, in a sense, that um, the point about Twitter is how it leaves things to be used by others, and how does that then, the claims made about it as a democratic medium are therefore contestable. In terms of this brought longer history issue, um, there are kind of, Margaret Dixon in her Rebel Reels uh, book, Rogue Reels book, does chart a link between these kind of groups. And in someone like the Black Audio Film Collective, you have someone who's a sense operating in both spheres of uh, an art-based filmic practice, but nevertheless operating in what was this union-created um, realm. And that came about through, that was really the culmination of a long series of discussions and debates between uh, unions and the earlier collectivized filmmaking groups, which culminated in this decision. Um, it was partly a recognition, I think, from earlier groups um, that arts funding in itself could not fully sustain the development of a critical voice, because arts funding went towards an asceticized form of filmmaking. And we've seen that evolve in Britain to quite a large extent. There's now very much a distinct aestheticized film and video tradition in Britain, which has almost entirely divorced itself from the politicized tradition, despite the fact the two coming from a similar origin. Um, how this fits into a longer history is I think that relationship with the unions and the kind of issues that that brought out to do with um, working conditions and fair regimes of production and such is quite an interesting argument in relation to free software and the kind of valorization of voluntary labor in the free software. And it's an aspect that I think is weak within the free software and open source movement is an understanding of this um, valorization of voluntary labor. And to an extent, the workshop declaration provides a model where people did try to tackle, acknowledge this and try to tackle it and find a framework that could enable the kind of flexibilities and self-motivational um, departures that that kind of working allowed, but at the same time protected it to some extent from exploitation. So I think there's an interesting um, kind of historical lesson for us to, to draw from that. Okay, final question. Um. Thanks for the explanation uh, on the last question. Do you also have uh, uh, some uh, examples of how to actually uh, tackle that problem uh, uh, within the open source uh, movement? There's a few. Um, Dimitri Kleiner's Copy Far Left proposal is an interesting proposal on those lines, which seeks to combine copyleft mechanisms of redistribution, uh, financial redistribution from within the projects and such. Um, I think also there is scope to look at the significance of free software in relation to other forms of unremunerated labor. So for example, the citizen's wage movement and the debates around that, I think have a great relevance to free software. Um, this is actually a topic I'm going to talk about at the Make Art Festival, I'm doing another advert, um, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so um, watch this space, as they say, um, for more news on that. But I think that's these kind of issues are quite important. Uh, it's a major kind of uh, lacuna in the free software rhetoric about this kind of um, valorization of voluntary production. And it's increasingly come to the fore as the development of open sources has progressed across uh, the more commercial media. Okay, thank you very much. Simon Yule. Yes.